Well, I'm trusting you all had a wonderful evening of sleep. Sleep is so important. It helps us handle stress, helps us to recover and to reboot and retool and restore the natural immunity God has given us. And I want to encourage everyone to do your very best to implement good sleep hygiene in your life. Good sleep hygiene in your life means respecting the circadian rhythm. God made the day, God made the night, and there are cycles. And our body releases different kinds of chemicals and hormones throughout the day that are symbiotic with that circadian rhythm. And I think it's very important, especially as Christians, to respect the tabernacle of God that God has given to us. And part of that is there's a time to work, there's a time to play, there's a time to have fun, and there's a time to sleep and time to rest. And that means taking the time to wind down, dim the lights, diminish the sensory perception that's out there, which obviously I mean, <laughs> I'll be very direct with you, turn those TV off and turn, 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 turn off completely any kind of social media and just give your mind and your heart a chance to quiet down. I think that's very important. And I think you'll find that you're You'll ease in, you'll dovetail into your sleep so much easier. Keep your room cooler and sleep every night the same time and wake up every morning the same time. And you'll find that your, your dream life, your deep sleep, the entire nature of your sleep will be so much more profitable for you. And that's what God wants for you. He wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be strong. He wants you to be victorious. And the Bible does says he gives his beloved sleep. So I hope and pray that you had a very blessed evening of sleep. Now today's talk is a very unusual one. So I hope you have your spiritual seatbelts on. It's called walking by faith. We've seen yesterday to how Jesus prepared a breakfast for his beloved disciples. Somehow we don't always see Jesus in this frame of light. We, But that's how he is. He wants to have fellowship with us, and he is prepared to make breakfast for us, and he brings the bread, and he wants us to bring something to the meal as well. And I think that the last couple of sermons have really focused and very unusual aspects of the life of Jesus and what he wants us to be like and, and the kind of relationship he wants us to have with him. Now, in today's talk, Walking by Faith, you're probably going to expect the usual Hebrews uh, discussion about what is faith and who are the people of, of faith are and what faith does and the mustard seed and Da 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 da. But if you've been watching this program for a while, the Jesus Channel, the Christ Jesus College and Seminary, we're raw, we're unfiltered, we're uncouth, we're unorthodox, we're mavericks, and we really want to get to the kernel of the truth and the Word of God. And so I'm using Mark chapter 9 as a, a baseline here for the subject of faith. Now, having read this again, I can tell you that it has many, many, many implications. And so let me just give you the background. The background here is that Jesus has just taken his select elite apostles to the Mount of Transfiguration. If you've never been there, I hope one day to take you there on a tour in the Holy Land. It's a very beautiful mountain. That's where Jesus showed his 
original glory that he had with God, and he was speaking with Moses and with Elijah. And God specifically said to his disciples, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Hearken unto him. Not to Moses, not to Elijah. The old covenant is going to be put away with. It's going to be fulfilled in the new covenant. And the problem today with many Christians and many churches today is that they're still living in the old law. They're living in the old covenant. I must do this. I must do this. I must not do this. Rather than saying, I want to do this because I love Jesus. That's the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. The old covenant is don't eat chocolate. Don't eat chocolate cake. The new, the new covenant is I really don't need, I really don't want, I have no I have no desire to eat chocolate cake because I'm having more fun having fellowship with Christ. That's the difference. And you see, that's the hallmark of what makes an apostolic church. You know, we read our creeds and we say, I believe in one apostolic church. Well, that means if you're really a Christian, if you're really truly a born-again Christian, if you're saved, if you're a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, you have all the fruit of the Spirit. You have certain gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that, that God has given to you, and you are obliged to be using them. And the Bible is very clear in many parts of the New Testament that we are to be walking by faith, not by sight. When I say by sight, there are people who cram their calendars with appointments. I'm I'm going to the lodge this time. I'm I'm going I'm going to go work out this this time. This is my vacation time. This is when I eat. Everything gets pre-programmed, and there's no liberty of the Holy Spirit to talk to you and say to you, why don't you stop and take an hour off and go visit your brother in the hospital and pray with them? You see, living by faith means that you're making yourself available and open to God's mindset, to God's agenda, to God's timetable, and you're going to be available to serve God, to worship God, the way God wants you to. The problem with Christians today is that we want to serve God the way we want to. That's not living by faith. Living by faith is letting go and letting God. And it means death to the ego. Sorry to say that, my friends. That's it. But that's that's totally biblical and totally scriptural. Death to the ego. Yes. It's either the old man or the new man. Now, the old man is our old nature. We're selfish, we're egotistical, we're sensitive, we're, we're rebellious, we're argumentative, and we get ourselves in trouble. The new man in Christ is meek, mild, docile to the Holy Spirit, sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It hates evil, it clings to good. And does everything in a spirit of love, not competition. Does everything in a spirit of love, not greed. Does everything in a spirit of love, not lust. And so we have a real challenge today because if this big trouble is coming our way, now there's going to be two groups of Christians here. Some Christians are saying, well, you know, we're going to have a recession, we're going to have an inflation, and then a couple of years later things are going to go back to normal. Okay. I respect your perspective. The reality is we are seeing biblical prophecies unfurl before our very eyes in lightning blitzkrieg formats. I challenge you to go on the internet today and see and, and study the amount of earthquakes that have been taking place over the past year, past two years, the past six months, the past three weeks, the past three weeks, there have been mega magnitude earthquakes all over the world, and you're not listening to it because you're not hearing it on the news. They're talking about the November elections. They're talking about this, this, and this. But Jesus warned us that there will be 
tremendous earthquake activity prior to his arrival. And so the only way that we can be really ready for his arrival is that we are walking in faith. We are walking in the Spirit. So the apostles have this wonderful, wonderful mountaintop experience with Jesus. And they come down back down to reality. And they're really going to have a reality check here. It's a very unusual account here we find here in Mark. And then we know in Mark that Peter is dictating the story of Jesus to John Mark. And it's the first gospel that's, that is actually published in a very important time because the Christians are being so severely persecuted, they need a gospel to read to remind them about the life of Jesus. So let me, see, so, so let me give you some background here about what this story is about and how this affects you. According to the CDC, as many as 15% of school-aged children have significant hearing loss in, in at least one ear. Now, this hearing loss can be mild. It could be severe. It could be as mild as maybe just hearing some background noise. And it could be so severe, it could render the child deaf. This is according to the CDC. According to the Better Hearing Institute, 1.5 million children have hearing and speech difficulties, perhaps even more. It's probably underdiagnosed. And most of these children are under the age of 18. Now, this causes a plethora of academic and social issues we're not going to go into. But I, I, I want to be very sensitive to our audience today, that I'm, and I'm aware that the word deaf mute is a political um, sensitive word, but it is used in the biblical term. So I'm going to be using it out of respect out of the biblical, biblical sense, but I'm also going to make note that it is a political sensitive word. But we also know from science that there are genetic factors, and many times this is due because of premature birth. Now, biblically, brother, biblically, we see and we understand through the Spirit that demonic activity, yes, demonic activity, we see much demonic activity both in the Old Testament and especially in the New Testament, and here are the areas that we see demonic activity. Epilepsy, deafness, blindness, muteness, suicidal feelings, schizophrenia, schizophrenia, to mention just a few. Now, what does the New Testament teach on this? The demonic spirits, they are predators. They prey on those who are weak mentally, physically, emotionally. Oftentimes, a person suffers a very severe trauma in their life, and they're unable to cope with that trauma both mentally, emotionally, and physically. And this leaves a vacuum of space open in their life for evil demonic spirits to come and reside inside their body and their soul. And if you don't believe this, that every time Jesus exercised a demon in the New Testament, what you're saying is that you don't believe that Jesus actually exercised a demon and that, that issue of... Of that person that, that at that time that it was that he was not demon possessed it was something else well that's an issue that you're gonna have to take up with Jesus and with, with, with what the Bible says the gospel of mark here demonstrates very clearly that our churches today our deacons today our chaplains today our pastors today they cannot help these people who have this deaf mute issue because one they're afraid of it they're afraid to confront it they don't believe they have the gifts they don't believe that we're in the apostolic church they may even be afraid of the devil they may even they, they even may be possessed of the devil themselves more importantly they may not have the necessary biblical tools and skills in mentoring to address these issues and what happens is that we end up giving these people more and more medications 
masking the problem and actually sometimes making it worse. So let's look into the life of Jesus here for a moment. We see in the life of Jesus so many times in the Gospels, and we see it in the book of Acts, where there's demonic activity in the human body. It's not filled with the Holy Spirit. These are people who are demonically possessed or controlled or influenced. And we realize that the, that these hordes of demonic beings, and when we have to t take recognition of this fact. See, we can't talk about faith unless we look at the problem. Ephesians 6 tells us that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. We are fighting with a very organized spiritual enemy that do, that does not have any bodies and they have a i mean they have a very strong pyramid structure from from satan on downward each of the lieutenants and majors and colonels and privates have a certain duty in this world and their and their duty is to hijack humanity to hijack the soul and the mind of the troubled individual and I will say this to you, that oftentimes people who are taking drugs, including alcohol, opens the door for this kind of demonic activity. Now, what does it have to do with the transfiguration? What does this have to do about walking by faith? Well, listen to the story. I'm going to read now to you Mark chapter 9. And we're going to hear this story about faith. And then we'll leave it at that. And then you are going to have to come to terms with, if you're really a Christian, you're going to have to come to terms with, are you really surrendered to God and allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit to really exude in your life? Have you come to terms to what your real gifts are? You may be living a life making money and, and you may be doing well, but spiritually you could be so way off, off base because you're not utilizing the gifts that God has given you, and he may very well decide to take those gifts away from you and give it to somebody else who will get the job done. So they're coming down the mountain, and now they're going to come, they're, they're going to have this huge reality check. And when he came to his disciples, so Jesus had many disciples. He's coming down with he's coming down the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And he came to the disciples and he saw a great multitude. And the scribes were questioning them. This is this, I mean, this is something huge is going on here. And straight away, right away, when all the people saw Jesus, Jesus has not just come down from the mountain, they were greatly amazed and they came running to Jesus and they saluted him. And Jesus asked the scribes, What questioning? What what are you questioning? What are you what what's what's the issue here? What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, This is where you circle. This is this is where this is the key, the key term for today. Master. He's calling Jesus in the Greek commander. He's calling him Lord. He's calling him the boss. That is how it's translated in the Greek. He's saying, boss. I have brought unto you I have brought unto you my son my son which hath a dumb spirit the boy is both deaf and mute and there's a problem he says in verse 18 wherever he taketh him that's the demon he teareth him he's harming the boy he foams at the mouth. He gnashes with his teeth. He pineth away. The boy is in turmoil. And I spoke to your disciples. I'm sure it's happening today. There are many people who do not realize that the church is the ultimate hospital for the spiritually sick. We are all spiritually sick and we need the church. And he said, I spoke to the disciples and they could not cast him out. They could not cast him out. 
Now look at the now look at the reaction of Jesus here. Look at the reaction of Jesus here. He's angry. He's angry. He has given the authority and the power to the disciples to do this. He said, go and heal. Go and exercise the demons. Go share the good news. He's given this power and authority to his disciples, and he's given it to us as well. And he answered, O faithless generation. So today's talk is walking by faith. What is Jesus saying? O faithless generation. You see, there are some people who are, who are talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And he's saying, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? And Jesus now takes matters into his own hand and he says, Bring the boy to me, bring him to me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw Jesus, he, meaning he, meaning the demon saw Jesus, straight away the spirit tore in the boy. You see, my friends, you can, if we're living a life right now and we are not taking into consideration that there is demonic activity, then we're not living by faith. We need to understand that there is demonic activity and it's going to increase harder, faster, and stronger as the soon return of Jesus Christ approaches. And it says here, straight away the spirit tear him and he fell on the ground and he was wallowing on the ground. He was foaming at the mouth. Now look at the diagnostic skills. Look how Jesus is the master physician. He says, and Jesus asked the father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? Jesus is the master physician. He said, "This he had this since he was a child, as, a, as he said, of a child. And he continues asking, how often? And he goes, well, oftentimes he casts himself in the fire. He casts himself into the water. He's suicidal. And now the father is now going into is going to enter the realm of faith. And I'm going to encourage you that whatever problems you have in your life, you take note of this. We take note of this, and we see now the Father has this immense, almost unsolvable problem. He's going to enter the realm of faith. He said, "But if you, no, he says, if thou can can do any, if you can do anything." Have compassion on us and help us. Now, what Jesus says here is so, so important. If you have a highlighter or a pen, you should underline this and memorize this. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. See, that's walking by faith. If you have faith, if you believe, all things are possible. Napoleon once said, take your dictionary and cut the word impossible out. This is so important. And now, this is where I'm affected. I don't know about you. I can't speak on your behalf, but this is where I'm affected. And this is where I get my encouragement. Verse 24 is where I get affected. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears coming down his face, Lord, now he's called him master, he's called him commander, and now he's reaffirming it again. He's saying, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. You see this? He's saying, I believe, but there's another part of me that's not believing. I need your help. So we know from the word of God that we get faith from two, two different ways. We get faith by the hearing of God's word, and we get faith because it's a gift, and we ask God for faith, and God gives us faith. And so this man is doing the exact right thing. He's being very honest with the Lord. When was the last time you were really honest with the Lord? When was the last time that you were brutally honest with yourself and the Lord? Let's be honest. I can say like this gentleman, I can say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm I'm on this ch channel here, but I'm not perfect. And I can say to the Lord and say, Lord, help my help my help me. I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, verse verse twenty five is beautiful. When Jesus saw the people coming and running, and it was, it's, a, it's a huge commotion going on. Jesus rebukes the foul spirit. But friends, you have to have faith that this is what's going on in the world today. What you're watching on the news, what you're seeing on social media, what you're seeing going on in this world today, it's all demonic activity. And the only way that you can counteract what's going on in this world today is not mental, it's not physical, it's not financial, it's spiritual, and it's a war of faith. Jesus rebuked the foul spirit, saying to him, now listen to, listen to this progression here, thou dumb and deaf spirit. I know it's politically sensitive. It's a polit may, may, it may be a politically incorrect word, but I'm quoting what the words of Jesus are here. It says, thou dumb and deaf spirit. I'm sure there are a lot of doctors right now that are scratching their heads and saying, well, I really don't know if this really fits into our medical model. I don't care if it fits into your medical model. This is what the Bible is saying, that Jesus used the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he exercised and he commanded this dumb and deaf spirit. He says, I charge thee, come out of him and enter him no more. Now, what's amazing here is that the spirit cried, it rent the boy. The boy went into this convulsion, and it came out of him. And the boy was so exhausted, he looked as if he was dead. In fact, many people said in verse 26, he is dead. Look at verse 27. But Jesus took him by the hand. Look at the love and compassion of Jesus. He took him by the hand, and he lifted him up, and the boy arose. Now, here's the take home. When Jesus came into the house, his disciples now, after getting their, 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 their booties whooped, okay? Yeah, sometimes as Christians we get our booties whooped. And what should we do? We should go to Jesus and ask him, what did I do wrong? They asked him privately, why couldn't we do it? Why did we fail? Why could we not cast him out? My friends, when you fail spiritually, go to Jesus and ask him. Don't go to your pastor. Don't go to your friend. Don't go to your wife. Don't go to your husband. Go to Jesus and ask, why did I fail on this, on this spiritual adventure? And Jesus will give the answer. And he said to them, I'm going to shock you here. And Jesus said unto them, this can not come forth but by nothing except by prayer and fasting. You see, a life of faith is going to involve a life of prayer, prayer in the Holy Spirit, and fasting. These are things that are not taught in church today. These are things that are not taught in the chapels today. These are things that are not, not taught in the seminaries today. These are not things that are taught in the families today. These are things that we don't see in movies or on TV. Prayer and fasting. My friends, I'm going to encourage you to read this again on your own and study for yourself, and you need to make a decision because I want to say to you, this is only found in the King James Version, the New King James Version, and surprisingly in the Catholic Bible, but in the NIV, the NLT, the NET, the NSAB, and the ESV, and many other translations of the Bible, the word fasting is crossed out. It's completely deleted. And that's where the fraudulent deception of Satan has come in, where we think we're praying, but there are times we need to pray and fast. So if you're having problems in your life, don't underestimate the demonic activity that could be present in your life. You shouldn't be afraid of it. We counteract that by prayer and fasting. And that is our talk today about walking in faith. I pray that this was this that this was inspirational, instructional. I pray it was pragmatic. I'm doing my very best to meet you on a daily basis because I love you, but he loves us the most. And remember, 
we do have the peace of the Lord that guards our mind and protects our hearts. And the joy of the Lord is our strength.